Hi guys, the first lecture for uh, the replacement uh, for September 26 scheduled lectures. We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system and both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And we're going to go through a number of um, topics, some of which we're going to touch on later this semester and also later throughout the year. So we won't spend a ton of detail on them, but I think it's important to talk about them from the standpoint of the pharmacology, um, receptor interaction, and, and to get a little bit more of a background on how drugs interact with the body. I think this is a good topic to dive into a little bit more detail on. Since we spend most of our time in the world of therapeutics, this is a good lecture just basically on pharmacology. We're going to touch base on drugs, and there's some topics that we aren't going to cover elsewhere, but most of these topics, probably 90% of them, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the actual therapeutics of it later. So the nervous system is divided into a number of things, and within the peripheral nervous system, you have uh, a pharmacologic focus that lands on the sympathetic nervous system, which is also known as the fight or flight response system, and the parasympathetic nervous system, or the rest and digest system. And by manipulating these systems, we can induce a number of pharmacologic actions, and that can affect a number of disease states positively. So. Uh, breaking it down a little bit further, we have basically two major um, players here with acetylcholine and norepinephrine, and they act as functional antagonists of each other, meaning that acetylcholine is basically the, the neurotransmitter in charge of the parasympathetic nervous system, where norepinephrine is really in charge of the sympathetic nervous system. So while they don't act on the same receptors, um, they basically have uh, functional antagonism of each other's effects. So they're really doing the opposite types of things. And when one system's in full gear, if your flight or fight, fight or <laughs> flight or fight response kicks in, um, your acetylcholine uh, isn't going to be quite as active. And so they, they functionally antagonize each other that way. Uh, so if we look a little bit about the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, interesting interestingly enough, acetylcholine is sort of the foundation of everything preganglionic. So when we have um, nicotinic receptors within um, the preganglionic nerve fibers, you have a uh, interaction there with acetylcholine. Now it's in the postganglionic fibers where you break it up into norepinephrine and acetylcholine, where the muscarinic receptors are uh, attaching to acetylcholine and you have norepinephrine attaching to mostly alpha and beta receptors in the body. So let's start with the parasympathetic nervous system. And again, this is our rest and digest uh, system or the housekeeping system. Uh, you can think about this as fueling the body, promoting growth, removing waste. Uh, and our drugs are going to target either the release of acetylcholine, binding of acetylcholine, or mimicking acetylcholine's effects on receptors, or the bioinactivation, metabolism of acetylcholine, uh, which is via an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Uh, so the nicotinic receptor subtype is a broad uh, group of receptors and uh, responsible for a number of different things, but um, they're all ligand-gated ion channel signaling. So what happens is you open up a channel that ends up um, uh, depolarizing the cell via either a potassium or a sodium channel. And these are preganglionic nerve fibers we're targeting. And so by doing this, you can stimulate a number of different reflexes. And some of, most of those, uh, from a therapeutic point of view, have to do with skeletal neuromuscular junction. So we can use these drugs to possibly, um, we can use drugs that mimic this response to possibly paralyze people uh, for therapeutic reasons. And we'll talk about that in a few slides here. Now, the muscarinic subtype receptors are much more, I think, interesting as far as pharmacology goes, and we're going to see a lot more uses for uh, muscarinic subtype uh, receptor um, activity. So these are really going to be the hallmark cholinergic effects. They're G-protein coupled, and a pretty logical drug response, I think, when you break it down. So there's different three different subtypes. We have um, M1, M2, and M3. And uh, M1 is really in the central nervous system, and uh, significance is not going to be a lot therapeutic, but um, there is some, some CNS receptors and research that shows that cholinergic activity is a, a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, and a lack thereof, should I say. And so if we can increase the prevalence of acetylcholine, we can therefore help with Alzheimer's disease. Um, M2 involves the myocardium, smooth muscles, so possibly uh, cardiac slowing could be of significance here, so if you have a fast heart rate. And M3, our endocrine glands, our smooth muscle and endothelium. And this is really 
uh, where it comes down to uh, a lot of pharmaceutical targets target this M3 specific receptor. So by looking at these receptors, you can see that they target a number of different areas in the body, which makes it a little difficult because we have a, a drug that hits all of them. We're going to get um, effects in the central nervous system, cardiac effects, and then smooth muscle contractile effects. And, and we don't want generally all of that in one drug. Um, but if we can target them specifically to the subtype of receptor like M3 specific, you can get a much more selective drug, much less side effects for the patient. Okay, so this diagram shows a little bit more about how acetylcholine works within our um, nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. And you can see that there's a number of different ways that drugs can attack uh, the system and, and alter it. So um, one, we have the synthesis of acetylcholine. So um, there's a drug that they give a uh, reference to called hemicolium, or hemicolinium, which isn't used anymore. So we'll ignore that one. Um, two, uptake into storage vessels. We don't really use that uh, mechanism either. Um, three, release of the neurotransmitter. Uh, this is one that we can block via, via botulinum toxin, or Botox is the brand name of that. And also some venoms cause this effect as well. And binding to the receptor, that's another one we can uh, work with, uh, with um, several different drugs work with that side of things. They'll block that binding. And degradation, that's where um, the enzyme acetylcholinesterase comes into play. And if we can inhibit acetylcholinesterase, you can increase the presence of acetylcholine. So overall, what are we talking about even here when it comes to acetylcholine? So a good question, and this slide shows really what you can think about when you ever hear anybody say cholinergic or cholinergic effects. What you want to think of is SLUD. SLUD is the easy way to remember it, I think, because it's a shorter acronym. I'm not a fan of like these weird long mnemonics, especially dumbbells, which has multiple Bs and only one L and two Ss. It's really hard to remember, um, but SLUD's easy, I think. So salivation, lacrimation, urination, and defecation. If you stimulate the cholinergic system by a pharmacologic agonist, you're going to get SLUD. Um, you'll also, of course, get dumbbells. Dumbbells is just an expanded version, and things are reordered a little bit. So it adds in things like um, meiosis, uh, bradycardia, bronchoconstriction, um, emesis, and sweating. A little bit different. But if you think about it, uh, it's all pretty much the same. You can think about um, the whole digestive system activating. So you're going to get that increase in um, the waste product removal system of the body activating and also just secretions of things in general. So tears, urine, sweat, etc. So if we move into drugs, let's talk about something that might act as a direct cholinergic agonist. These really, drugs really don't have much role in therapy. And as you can imagine, we don't really want to cause SLUD type effects. There's no real therapy. There's, well, there's few therapeutic benefits in causing it. And most people are going to be so uncomfortable if you cause uh, direct cholinergic effects that they're, they aren't going to tolerate whatever therapeutic benefit you're trying to get out of the drugs. So really not a great uh, system. But there are some drugs out there that work in this. excuse me, that work in this area, but um, aren't really used. They're mostly for historical purposes that I mentioned these. So really, we don't really care too much about these. There's some um, ophthalmic applications, so like pilocarpine is a meiotic agent. Um, could be used for glaucoma. We do use some, some drugs the, um, in more procedural area type things, but we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about the ophthalmic, ophthalmic agents uh, specifically. Um, nicotine is a direct uh, nicotinic receptor stimulant, so it really does work um, to stimulate the whole parasympathetic system, and it also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system too. So I slotted in here because it is kind of a, a direct cholinergic agonist, although it's working upstream in those preganglionic targets. That's why it's coming downstream to the parasympathetic and sympathetic, which is a little bit confusing because but it should make sense if you think about the, the hallmark effects of cigarette smoking. You think that people it acts as a bit of a stimulant. It can cause vasoconstriction, uh, increase of heart rate. And uh, at the same time, people tend to feel digestive effects from it. So they may um, feel like they have to have a bowel movement after smoking a cigarette first thing in the morning. And those effects are seem conflicting because they're on two comp completely different sides of the um uh, nervous system, but they uh, do make sense when you think about how the drug works and works upstream in those preganglionic targets. Um, so we're going to talk about nicotine and nicotine replacement in a lot of detail next spring, but basically there's a lot of drugs we can give that just based, act as nicotine. They are nicotine and they're just delivery mechanisms are different. So there's patches, gums, inhalers, 
and they're designed to replace cigarette cravings and used as needed until somebody can hopefully taper off of them completely. Um, we can use indirectly, we can use cholinergic agents to that indirectly, and there is some more um, pharmacologic benefit here than a direct agonist. Um, acetylcholinesterase inhibition, so we're, we're again inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse, and if we can break that down, you're going to get an increased concentration of acetylcholine. When that happens, you end up with um, uh, some positive effects, ideally in the central nervous system. So the, these drugs specifically work to um, combat Alzheimer's disease. And the interesting thing about them is that the, the primary one that's out there, and I guess, I guess I'll just go to the next slide here. Um, well, these ones are older, <laughs> so we'll get to the primary one that's of real pharmaceutical importance on the next slide, but I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, but these drugs are all basically not used a lot in clinical practice, where what we do use actually are the first bullet point, neostigmine, um, gets used in procedural areas. It's a quick reversal of paralytic agents. So if you have to paralyze somebody for some type of a procedure, once you're done and you want them to come back, you want to reverse that paralytic agent, you can give them a bit of neostigmine. Very quick onset, doesn't last very long, um, and again, it's used for reversal of uh, paralytic agents. Edrophonium does not is not really useful in clinical trial or in clinical practice. Praladoxime is something that's extremely rarely used for um, uh, various um, agents such as uh, organophosphate poisoning, which would be like for large scale industrial farming, perhaps um, a lot of fertilizers or pesticides could have organophosphates in them, or um, warfare agents like sarin gas is an example. But it'd be really unusual to see praladoxime ever needed to be used. So what I was getting at is the one that's actually more, uh, the drugs that are actually more beneficial uh, in clinical practice. And again, they're Alzheimer's disease drugs. And the reason these drugs are nice is that they work, specifically, specifically it's focused on the first one, denepazil or Aricept, works um, mostly within the central nervous system. And the idea behind that is that you increase presence of acetylcholine within the central nervous system directly to target those muscarinic M1 receptors. Uh, but you don't really have any effects elsewhere in the body, so you basically avoid having the SLUD type effects, which is a great thing because that, those are side effects that are unnecessary in this disease. We don't want to cause them if we can avoid it. Um, there's a couple other drugs, rivastigmine and galantamine, um, that are uh, ones uh, like rivastigmine comes as a patch, which if you give it transdermally, tends to be better tolerated than orally. Um, but denepazil is by far and away the most important one here. We're going to talk about these drugs more talk about kind of geriatrics and psych stuff next semester, but just to give you an intro at how this gets applied, um, this is one way that we can get a, an actually pretty decent pharmacologic agent out of stimulating the, the cholinergic receptors indirectly. All right, so switching gears to antagonists. So these drugs are going to be anticholinergic. So anticholinergic is something I'm going to say a lot throughout the year um, because a lot of drugs um, inadvertently have anticholinergic side effects. And we don't like things that are anticholinergic generally because they're uncomfortable. Uh, they make people constipated. They make people feel dry in general, dry mouth, dry tear ducts, dry eyes, um, constipation, I said already, urinary retention, um, and then again, anti-dumbbells type stuff too. But generally, not very comfortable. Um, however, there are a few, few more pharmacologic applications than our standard cholinergic agonists. Um, there's a lot of different funny names for the, the anticholinergic side effects, like hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter. There's a couple other ones. Uh, bowel and bladder um, lose their tone while the heart runs alone is another one that people um, use as a way to remember um, anticholinergic anti effects. So. Uh, atropine is kind of the classic anticholinergic. It's got no influence on nicotinic receptors. It's purely anti-muscarinic. And you have clinical applications involving um, acute bradycardia. So for people who are in unstable bradycardia, you can give a small dose, uh, half a milligram. And it comes in these pre-made syringe things that are used in um, for like a, an emergency if you needed to give somebody some right away. And um, it's not effective in all of these types, and you're going you're gonna to learn more about this. We're going to talk more about this a little bit during emergency medicine, and you're going to take ACLS next summer, and you'll, you'll learn about it then, too. So, again, that's all I really want you to know is that it's used acutely to treat bradycardia in some situations. 
Um, you can also give it for secretions. So again, anticholinergic effects dry people out. So if somebody's having excessive drooling, which can happen from some medication side effects, potentially it can happen for other reasons too. But um, I tend to see it used with medication side effects. One, some, sometimes we'll use um, uh, atropine comes as a ophthalmic agent, as an eye drop, and we can actually give those drops to people sublingually, and it can help dry out the secretions of their mouth. So a specific example, there are a couple antipsychotics that work that way that cause people to drool a lot. Um, there are some sedatives we give that may cause excess drooling, and we can give a little bit of atropine, dries people out, and it prevents you from having to keep suctioning them to keep their airway clear. So there's some advantages to giving it that way. Uh, and, and atropine can also be considered as an antidote. Um, so if you had cholinergic poisoning, like uh, eating some mushrooms that are working, that have some compounds in them that work as direct cholinergic agonists, this could be a drug that might help reverse some of those side effects. Uh, and again, it does come as an ophthalmic agent. So a pre-procedural, it, it does cause mydriasis. We tend to use different types of drugs. And again, I'm going to go through that a little bit more during the ophthalmic lecture, but um, there is an application to atropine there. Atropine just, it lasts a long time, so it leaves people in that mydriatic state quite long, so then your pupil is expanding, you know, when you leave the eye doctor and you can't see for a while. Well, atropine will last much longer than some of the other agents we use that are shorter acting that work similarly, but it's the same general concept. Um, anticholinergics can have some decent anti-emetic effect. They work in the um, chemo trigger zone within the central nervous system and block uh, some activity of, of acetylcholine, which can um, be one of uh, a number of different ways that the body can trigger a uh, nauseous or vomiting response. Um, there's a couple drugs uh, that work for this, and they're all they're all kind of different. They don't really work directly on nausea, and most of them are best used as prophylactic agents. So, like scopolamine patches are patches uh, like in the image here, applied behind the ear, a little dime-sized patch, and these uh, release really scopolamine transdermally, and this is designed for um, uh, motion sickness. And so you would put it on four hours prior to exposure. So four hours before you get on your cruise ship, you can wear it up to 72 hours before replacing it. And uh, it's really designed for short-term use, not long-term exposure. The side effects are pretty minimal. Um, I have seen issues where people have used these for a really long time or forgotten to take them off and put others on. And so even though it only lasts about 72 hours, you could still get some level of drug leaching through. Uh, and it can end up causing some some toxicity at that point. Um, meclizine or antivert is uh, a drug that is about um, well, it, it, as far as its usefulness, it's again mostly it's I put in the same boat as scopolamine. It's a uh, um, anti nausea medication for motion sickness for the most part. So people will take this. Uh, you can take it maybe about an hour prior to exposure. It lasts about 24 hours, and it is over the counter, whereas scopolamine patches are ARCs only, but they pretty much have the same use. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Benadryl or diphenhydramine during the antihistamine slide set coming up next. But Benadryl or diphenhydramine or its cousin dimenhydrinate are uh, antihistamines that have pretty strong anticholinergic properties. So while they're first and foremost an antihistamine, they're also really anticholinergic. Uh, and so despite that they aren't necessarily designed for uh, their use as an antiemetic, they do work decently and they can be used as an option for, um, uh, uh, for nausea and vomiting. Uh, major side effects, generally speaking, anticholinergic drugs are quite sedating. And so the besides our general anticholinergic effects of just the anti-slud type effects, you're going to feel quite sedated taking any type of these as an anti-emetic usually. Scopolamine patches, probably not quite as much. Everything else is probably going to sedate you. I should mention too quickly, with, with in general, with anticholinergics. One of the things that I'll, I'll talk about throughout the course is, oh, this drug is strongly anticholinergic, so we don't like it. Well, it, yes, it causes side effects, but another reason is that um, older people tend to be much more sensitive to anticholinergic side effects. Specifically, when patients get to the elderly status, they are going to um, probably feel it a lot more, and so we're really careful with um, our elderly patients and exposing them to too much anticholinergic medication. It can be quite toxic for them can cause not only um, anti-slud types of effects, which are problematic, 
but it can also cause um, some not necessarily dementia type symptoms, but short term delirium um, is something we've seen happen too from just too much anticholinergic medication. So try and be careful with that. Uh, as far as respiratory applications go, we'll get into these details quite a bit more in a couple lectures here with um, the uh, the respiratory stuff we're going to cover. But uh, there are anticholinergic drugs that work directly in the pulmonary tissue. And um, one of the older drugs is ipra ipratropium, which is atrovent. Atrovent is a bronchodilator, um, and it alert you get anticholinergic effects on the pulmonary smooth muscle on muscarinic receptors within the pulmonary smooth muscle. It relaxes that smooth muscle which um, allows the lungs to open up a little bit more. Um, you can give it as a nebulizer or as a specific inhaler. It also comes in combination with albuterol, which we're going to talk about as well uh, pretty soon here, uh, which is a beta agonist. Um, you can use it, mostly this, uh, this drug is short acting, so it's used acute, but some people will take it chronically too, although they have to take it multiple times a day. And there's a nasal spray as well, but it works um, on the nasal mucosa to help open up the nasal passages for congestion. Uh, it's not a super common drug, but we do see it used occasionally. Um, there are some long acting formulations that work uh, for pulmonary applications, and Teotropium or Spiriva. Um, there's another drug called Umeclidinium, which is a, um, uh, a different inhaler too, that are basically long acting versions. They're getting selective, M3 selective, and they're long acting. There's a picture, picture of the Spiriva inhaler, inhaler, and we'll talk a lot more about those when we go through the respiratory application lecture. All right, urinary incontinence is another great application for anticholinergic drugs. So um, as the if the bladder is, if somebody's having issues with bladder spasm or um, for some reason they're having incontinence, what this can, what stimulating muscarinic receptors in the bladder can do is decrease urgency and frequency by relaxing the smooth muscle and then hopefully decreasing the urge to, to urinate or the frequency of urination. There's a lot of drugs and um, we're going to talk about these a little bit more specifically at the end of the semester when we talk about gen, uh, genitourinary topics very briefly. Um, but oxybutynin is a common medication used for this. Um, it's got pretty good efficacy. It's inexpensive. Um, it does. It is a little bit less selective than some of the other ones. So um, selectivity is going to cause less side effects. So the, the nice thing is, is that as these drugs have developed, drug companies have made them more selective, specifically for M3 and specifically for some M3 um, subtypes that reside in the bladder alone. And by doing that, we've been able to really focus them on uh, use within the bladder and not causing systemic side effects, which is helpful tremendously for geriatric use. However, some of the newer drugs are quite a bit more expensive, so um, old drugs like oxybutynin still tend to be uh, quite effective. Neurologic applications to anticholinergics. Um, not a ton here, but there are a couple drugs I'll just point out quickly. Um, this benztropine gets a little bit hard to explain outside of the context of psychiatric medications. Uh, I'll try and explain it really briefly. Psychiatric medications work in the central nervous system on dopamine receptors or dopamine antagonists. And while that can work with uh, to prevent people from having delusions and hallucinations, it can also cause movement disorders and what we call Parkinsonism-like sym symptoms. So it kind of sounds like it's like an induction of Parkinson's disease but it's not really Parkinson's disease. It's just really the symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease, but it's mostly related to the drug. So it causes tremors, movement disorders, um, and to prevent that with some of some of these drugs cause it, and to prevent that, we can give a drug called benztropine or cogentin. Um, we also use Benadryl or diphenhydramine quite a bit too, which is also quite anticholinergic, which helps as well. So there's um, a few different drugs we do. Uh, and then there's another one called trihexylphenidyl, which is a little bit longer, but we'll come back to these during um, our psychiatric lecture, specifically when we talk about schizophrenia. Ophthalmic agents. Uh, so I talked about some of these, and they all pretty much do the same thing. I talked about atropine already. Um, cyclopentylate, tropicamide are all uh, ophthalmic anticholinergic drugs. And again, they open up the pupil. Uh, they're mydriatic agents, and they... Um, uh, work to help with procedures uh, that are um, op ophthalmic nature. And they're basically different in as far as their duration of action goes. And that's really it.
Uh, I just bolded cyclopentylate. I should highlight that. I bolded it because it's a common one. I think tropicamide is used a, a bit too, and those are both relatively short acting compared to some of the other ones. Uh, within the GI tract, uh, we can. You might have thought of this already when we were talking about slut effects. Well, what if somebody's having diarrhea, or what if somebody's having some sort of GI issues? Can we use this to our advantage? And yes, we can. Um, you can do a couple things within the GI tract by getting something anticholinergic. You can reduce secretions, and you can cause smooth muscle relaxation um, by working against those um, by um, antagonizing your uh, your muscarinic receptors. Um, dicyclamine is a drug called Bentol. It's used to treat irritable bowel and minor diarrhea. It's IV and PO, and it's an anticholinergic agent that I see used occasionally in RED for um, just people who are having some sort of like bowel trouble and there's nothing really wrong with them. They might try Bentol and see if it improves their symptoms. Uh, there's a couple other drugs too, hyoscyamine, glycopyrrolate. They're all they all work pretty similar, and they're going to get into the GI tract. They're going to um, inhibit smooth muscle tone decreased secretions, um, and what that does is you get reduced peristalsis. Um, it causes constipation, um, which is hopefully desirable in this situation. Um, so you can get uh, get a variety of, uh, of therapeutic benefits, but you can also overdo it too. You don't want to cause too much anticholinergic activity and paralyze somebody's you know bowel and cause an obstruction or something. That would be, of course, not ideal. So um, you got to be careful with these drugs, but generally speaking, they, they work in small doses, so it's usually not an issue. Um, skeletal muscle relaxants are a mixed bag, and we're going to talk about them more with pain. Um, there's a number of drugs that work, and, and they don't necessarily work purely as anticholinergic, so I'm not really going to go into them too much right now, just to let you know that there are drugs that work as muscle relaxants, and um, they, people can take those for acute pain or acute muscle spasm, and sometimes for chronic. So like if you're a spinal cord injury patient, there may be some chronic medication to take, but again, the, the cholinergic aspect of them is only one part of their mechanism. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about pain. Um, and actually, I think I, I do. I did throw a slide in here on it, so I guess we will talk about it a little bit more today. Um, but that's that's all the detail I'll go into. And we'll talk about neuromuscular junction blocking agents, which is really just taking the concept of a spasmolytic and increasing it substantially so that you're fully paralyzing the muscles from moving at all. And there's another slide coming up on those as well. Um, so spasmolytic drugs, again, um, these have multiple mechanisms of action. So cyclobenzaprine or flexorol is a really common one, and it has some alpha activity. It increases norepinephrine presence in the central nervous system as well, uh, but it does have significant anti-muscarinic properties. It's use, useful for acute um, muscle spasm. So a lot of times if somebody has back spasm, uh, it might be a drug that they try. And then there's several other ones that, again, I don't even want to go into detail on right now because we're going to come back to it when we talk about pain substantially, but just to give you uh, uh, just a little hint on what these drugs can do. Um, throwing in Botox here, botulinum toxin, um, there's, uh, of course, broad applications for this in the cosmetic world as far as... Um, getting rid of wrinkles. But what, the way the drug works is it uh, is injected into the actual nerve itself, and it, you, so basically you're paralyzing a nerve locally uh, by decreasing its ability to release um, acetylcholine, and then therefore the nerve can't really do anything, the muscles can't contract, therefore the skin relaxes, and you decrease the appearance of wrinkles. Um, we can use this more therapeutically too, so like for example, <clears throat> somebody has a spasticity disorder, um, they might have a permanent, um, permanently flexed muscle. So like if somebody's had a stroke, somebody's had a spinal cord injury, it might damage, cause enough nerve damage where they might have a permanently spastic arm or leg or, you know, some place in their body that's um, co constantly flexed. So like um, I, I saw a patient once who had their arm was kind of always flexed at a right angle. Um, like always bent basically. So there was bent and their hand was bent too. And uh, the physician who saw her would treat her with Botox and he would inject the Botox directly into her nerves. And he had a special device that would tell him when he was at the nerve by sensing the electricity with the nerve. It was pretty cool. And then they inject a small amount of Botox into each muscle 
um, depending on what it is, and then they get the response they want. So um, the patient ends up getting a, a fairly relaxed, and the idea is that you want to relax it enough so that the patient, person can use it and move it, but not so much that it's just kind of flopping around without any control. So that's where it comes in. Um, play. We also can use Botox for tension migraines as well. Similar concept, you want to inject it into the muscle that's spasming and causing the migraine. And um, excessive sweating is a, another kind of cosmetic indication, but people have gotten injected into their um, axillary areas to prevent sweating too. So that's something that um, happens. Botox uh, doesn't last forever. It lasts about six months, sometimes less. So um, if you do want sustained effects with Botox, you have to go in every six months to get your injection. It's expensive. Um, insurance doesn't always pay for it, especially if it's cosmetic. Obviously, they aren't going to pay for that. And... Um, the other thing about Botox, too, is your body can, it's a big protein, um, so your body can develop an antibody response to it, which isn't dangerous, but it makes it so the Botox won't be effective. Your body will actually neutralize it as soon as it's injected, and then you can't really use Botox at all. So there's uh, some risk to it. Generally speaking, it's a pretty safe agent, even though it's also one of the most toxic substances on Earth. Um, but we don't inject it into people's veins, so, so we're just injecting it into the nerve itself and paralyzing the nerve locally. It doesn't get into the bloodstream, therefore it's not um, not as problematic as if you know somebody got a, a, a full dose. Like we talk about Botox or botulinum toxin as a chemical warfare agent, and it's just this is a totally different situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so taking everything to the extreme and blocking the neuromuscular junction itself, what we can do is mimic acetylcholine's activity. Um, and so acetylcholine is going to cause contractility uh, when it hits the neuromuscular junction. Uh, what a drug called succinylcholine does, it's basically just a, a slightly modified version of acetylcholine. It's a bigger acetylcholine, basically. And it hits the same spot, and it depolarizes. And what that does is it, 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 react, it causes the muscles to... To um, it, it works basically just like acetylcholine, but it stays on that receptor long enough where it prolongs the nicotinic agonism, and you get depolarization effect. Um, so by doing that, uh, you end up paralyzing the patient. It's got a nice short duration, about five to fifteen minutes. So for really quick procedures where you need a little bit of paralysis, it's a really ideal agent. Um, one thing it does is because it leaves, it leaves potassium channels open for a while, which is how it depolarizes. And we're going to talk a little bit more about sucks when we talk about um, some procedural stuff when it comes to emergency medicine. I'll, I'll go back over it again, so we'll go a little bit more into depth on it. The basic idea is that it, it leaves your potassium channels open, um, causing the cell to retain in a extended depolarized state. It can't repolarize then. And so what happens is um, you do get a bit of a transient increase in um, potassium. And that can be problematic if somebody's potassium is already elevated or if they have muscle damage uh, and some other indications. Um, you can't really overdose somebody on succinylcholine. It's got a really short half-life, so you can give them a big bolus of it, paralyzes them, and it's going to leave their system fairly quickly. This is just showing what's going on with uh, the polarization cycle of the cell and uh, succinylcholine. So when you... Um, cause uh, an action potential via um, some sort of stimulus, so in this case acetylcholine, you're going to cause depolarization. And what happens is you open these sodium channels, and then as the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open, they stay open. So you repolarize, but you can't, so as the cell depolarizes, it stays in kind of a, a sustained state while these potassium channels are just open. Potassium channels never close, therefore you can never get back to your resting level. Um, there's some non-depolarizing agents too. So whereas um, succinylcholine works like acetylcholine um, on the actual end plate itself, these drugs work on the other side of things. So they actually work on um, uh, blocking <clears throat> and competing directly with acetylcholine. So they're going to be slightly different as far as how they work, and they're just going to—they're basically an antagonist of acetylcholine. Whereas succinylcholine is essentially an, uh, an agonist that's working itself, working a little bit too well, if that makes sense. So you have two different functions here, um, and these drugs are the curiums, so we have or uroniums. So there's rock uronium, vecuronium, pancuronium, and they're used for paralysis for procedural 
um, indications for a variety of different things. And we'll go through some of this more again during emergency medicine. Um, you probably talk about it a little bit when you talk about um, your surgery module, and um, you'll, you'll, you'll come back to some of these too. But they're really short acting. For the most part, you're looking at uh, maybe an hour total action for something like vecuronium, maybe a little bit less than that for rocuronium. So the kinetics are a little bit different with the different dr drugs, but they all work pretty much the same way. Okay. Nice thing about these drugs is there's no contraindications. So somebody's potassium could be high. They could have um, significant muscle trauma and crush, like a crushed limb where they're leaking a lot of potassium into their bloodstream. And you don't have to worry about um, that sustained depolarization phase because it's not a big deal. It doesn't happen in these drugs. These drugs are competing for acetylcholine, so acetylcholine can't bind to the right area. All right, so um, I obviously can't answer any questions right now, but uh, you can email me questions if you have them, of course. Um, I think that the thing to remember about this is we're coming back to essentially all of these topics with the exception of a couple um, throughout the course. And again, this is just an introduction to some receptor-based pharmacology, talking about how things work with receptors, antagonism, agonism, getting you more familiar with those terms and helping to move those kind of thought processes along. And with that, we're going to move on to the sympathetic nervous system and uh, discuss that side of things now. Okay, just to review, remember that acetylcholine is stimulating things preganglionic for each side of this um, two-sided part of the uh, peripheral nervous system. So uh, moving on to the sympathetic nervous system, once you get past preganglionic to postganglionic fibers, norepinephrine is the, the neurotransmitter that is um, providing most of the stimulus here. So Remember, this is our fight or flight response. So this is the reactive system. It's not a housekeeping system, and it's something that has to be basically triggered um, by either something that you see externally, something that's going on internally. Maybe like um, you know, if something's happening, if you have uh, if you're having a heart attack or something, your fight or flight response is going to kick in, and you're going to get a big burst of norepinephrine, trying to compensate for some of the things that are going wrong in your system. Or like in this picture, if you cross a giant bear, you're going to have a large amount of adrenaline or norepinephrine that goes into your system. Um, this system uses fuel. It uses up energy. Um, it stops any non-essential physical process, so digestion, um, among other things. And it shunts blood from the periphery to the core so that you have um, everything's really focusing on your heart so that your heart can pump at its maximum um, capabilities. And by stopping your non-essential physical processes and using fuel, you're essentially halting the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's why you have um, a functional antagonistic effect using um, this system. Um, our drugs basically target our native sites of catecholamines. Catecholamines is just a fancy word for things that stimulate the system. So catecholamines are most, again, we're going to use norepinephrine as our primary drug here, but dopamine is also a catecholamine, and epinephrine is a catecholamine. Um, there's a couple other drugs that mimic catecholamine response that we're going to talk about as well. All right, so I got the episode from The Hangover here. If you see a tiger in your bathroom, you're probably going to get a physiologic response similar to the fight or flight response. And your hemodynamics are going to go a little bit crazy. Your heart rate's going to go up and your blood pressure is going to go up. So what's going to happen is blood's shunting, which is going to be caused via vasoconstriction. So one thing to remember about norepinephrine and anything that's catecholamine or sympathomimetic is that, that it's going to cause vasoconstriction. So that's going to cause shunting, decrease of blood vessel size, and therefore increase in blood pressure. Also, you have receptors on your heart that, when triggered by the system, are going to cause increases in chronotropic activity and inotropic activity, which means you're going to get an increase in heart rate, and you're going, which is chronotropic, and you're going to get an increase in force of heart beat or force of the heart pump itself, which is inotropic activity. Uh, bronchodilation is going to happen. You know, when you're having a situation like this, you want more oxygen everywhere. And um, that's going to, there's receptors, beta receptors in the lungs that are going to be um, triggered by the system, which is going to cause a expansion of lung tissue, allowing your body to take in more oxygen. Uh, muscle tone is generally increased and glucose availability is um, uh well, glucose is made more available for um, all types of cells to take in and to use as an energy source. 
Okay, so I, I'm not going to test you on this slide at all, but I just wanted to show you what um, catecholamine biosynthesis looks like to show you that they're all kind of related. So when I talked about dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, they're all synthesized from each other. So we have um, dopa, which goes to dopamine, which gets changed to norepinephrine, which gets changed to epinephrine. And epinephrine is just another word for adrenaline, uh, right? So epinephrine is uh, the, the kind of the primary one, but we use norepinephrine as, as our... Um, is our archetypical sympathomimetic just because it, it's it's sort of the the happy medium between everything else. Uh, this shows a little bit about what's going on as far as where these are working. So when it comes to uh, and this is this is going back and combining um, with the uh, with the um, parasympathetic system as well. So what you have here are some postganglionic receptors that are working on heart and vessels. So you get some some activity there. Uh, again, we talked about how like anticholinergic effects can um, help with a bradycardic episode. So that'll make sense here, whereas acetylcholine will slow down heart rate. Um, so again, functional antagonism, norepinephrine hitting the beta and alpha receptors in the heart and vessel is going to increase your heart rate. Um, and there's also some effects with dopamine. So dopamine specifically here by itself works a lot in the kidneys. So dopamine can help with, uh, in, in a fight or flight response situation, can help increase um, blood flow to the kidneys so that the kidneys aren't totally getting um, basically the short end of the stick because all this blood's getting shunted to the core. Kidneys need to remain viable. Um, if they go into kidney failure, you're, you know, you're, you're in a really rough spot as a human being in general. So you need to keep blood flow to kidneys and dopamine can help with that. All right, so breaking this down in a nice easy table, targets um, are alpha and beta receptors primarily, and then of course, and then there's also dopamine receptors. So alpha receptors are primarily located in blood vessels, smooth muscles, and the prostate gland. Sorry about the typo there. Um, and uh, they're going to generally have vasoconstrictive effects. So this could be good for the most part if it's shunting blood vessels. It can also have problem at, problems too if your um, prolonged vasoconstriction can cause ischemia um, and can cause tissue damage. So we don't want to overdo this, but in the short term, it's a good um, biologic response uh, to what's going on or what you're trying to avoid, hopefully, is um, either um, some sort of a shock situation or some sort of an external source that's threatening you. Uh, beta 1, beta 2. Beta 1 is primarily cardiac. Great way to remember this. Beta 1, you have one heart. Beta 2, you have two lungs. So beta 1 is going to be your heart cardiac receptors and it's going to increase inotropic and chronotropic activity again. Beta 2 is going to be present mostly in smooth muscle, blood vessels, skeletal muscle, and liver. So smooth muscle including primarily the lungs. Um, and it's going to cause relaxation. So that relaxation effect is what's going to basically cause um, the GI tract to slow down and stop, um, and it's going to cause an uh, increase of uh, release of glycogen so that you have, um, or glycogenolysis, so you're breaking down glycogen into glucose, so increase availability of glucose. And vasodilation is, is prime here for um, getting blood flow to, or getting um, relaxation to the lungs so that they can increase oxygenation of tissues. And then dopamine is working in the kidneys, so that's pretty much it. But dopamine also can hit some other receptors too. So while there's specific dopamine receptors in the kidneys, dopamine as a drug can also hit beta, beta-1, alpha, alpha-1. And we're going to go through that here in a little bit. And I'm going to go through these more in detail when we talk about shock, which is going to come up in the emergency medicine critical care lecture series next summer. So we'll, we'll go through this again. So when it comes down to our adrenergic or sympathomimetic mechanisms of action. What you're looking at is adrenaline or noradrenaline or epinephrine, norepinephrine, whatever you want to call them. Adrenaline is the British version of, of the same thing, so they're interchangeable. Um, you've got your alpha and beta receptors, and they all work a little bit differently. So if we want to dig into the pharmacology a little bit, this is the slide to, to look at if you're interested. So if you remember back to our first lecture, we talked about G-protein coupled receptors. So this is a cell wall here, and these are your receptors built in. And so as your um, transmitter here targets these different receptors, you're going to get activity. And so they're G-protein coupled, which um, me means that as soon as you hit that receptor, you're causing a protein to have a downstream effect within the cell. In this case, for example, with alpha-1, 
receptors when you target them, you end up with uh, this phospholipase C enzyme, which activates, which eventually causes uh, an influx in calcium ion, which has a smooth muscle contraction effect. Um, good general rule of thumb, if you have influx of calcium, it's generally a contractile mechanism. Um, <clears throat> whereas <clears throat> if you have something like magnesium, it's going to usually cause smooth muscle relaxation. Calcium is generally a contractile ion. And alpha-2 is a little bit weird in how it works. Let's not worry too much about it right now. Um, alpha-1 is the primary uh, and much more commonly found receptor that's going to be uh, found in smooth muscles. So when we're talking about really the sympathetic response, alpha-1s primarily, but we kind of lump them together. Um, alpha-2 has some other activities in other areas of the body, specifically like in the central nervous system. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later with some different drugs. Um, beta receptors um, have a bit different of a pharmacologic process where they have this adenyl cyclase, which um, uh, triggers a cyclic AMP response. Cyclic AMP triggers a process that allows for contraction of smooth muscle, or, or heart muscle and smooth muscle, excuse me, heart muscle contraction, smooth muscle relaxation, and um, glycogenolysis. All right, so adrenergic mechanism of action, uh, when it comes to our cardiac, when we talk about cardiac effects just a little bit more, um, key players here, adenylyl cyclase, cyclase, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is cyclic AMP, and calcium ions really are what makes up this um, uh, trio of um, intracellular activity that's going to cause the um, end-all, be-all, which is going to be the um, effects of a stimulation of a beta receptor. So when it comes to stimulating a beta receptor, okay. here it's showing the endogenous release of norepinephrine, which could be replaced with any type of agonist, pharmacologic agonist we're going to use, stimulating either beta-1 or a beta-2 receptor. Again, G-protein coupled. Um, uh, ATP is going to interact with adenylyl cyclase to cause cyclic AMP to form, which is then going to cause a chain reaction that's basically going to lead you to an influx of calcium ion intracellularly, which then causes contractile activity. And so this is cardiac activity. Um, if you look at that same beta receptor on a smooth muscle cell, so an example of this could be the lungs. What's happening here is a pretty similar looking process. And you get this influx of calcium. What's happening is the cyclic AMP is actually causing a process that causes the, the calcium ions to be used as a cofactor, which basically eliminates their ability to cause as much of a vasoconstrictive response, therefore relaxing the cell. So it's a little bit of a different mechanism, but same receptors. Um, shock is something we're going to go into more detail on in, cardio, in emergency medicine and critical care, but what we're really looking at here is um, a reduction of systemic tissue perfusion, uh, resulting in decreased oxygenation. And uh, either you're having, uh, there's different types of shock. There's cardiogenic shock, which uh, basically means that your heart isn't working correctly. Um, so your cardiac output, which is CO, is down. Um, and then to compensate, your body releases norepinephrine to help with the heart, but it's not working for whatever reason. So that increases your blood pressure peripherally. Uh, there's septic shock, which is caused by an external um, infective organism usually, and that's going to cause some systemic inflammatory response, and that's going to decrease um, blood pressure because you have a, a, a vascular expansion and increase um, cardiac output. Um, septic could start um, there as, as the heart tries to compensate. It could end up getting to a point where it can't keep up, and then you could end up with a cardiogenic picture as well as a septic picture. The problem with shock is it causes end organ damage. So if you can't perfuse your tissues, you lose your kidneys, you can damage the eyes, you can have a stroke, you can um, cause um, cardiac di uh, damage and arrhythmia as well, which can be uh, ultimately fatal. So this is something we treat very seriously. So somebody is in shock um, and their blood pressure is low. Usually we start with fluids to try and um, increase their vascular volume. If that doesn't work, we move on to different drugs pretty quickly. These drugs are kind of no one specifically why well, I should point out um, the first three. Let's call the first three the pressors. Um, phenylephrine is a, a pharmacologic basic peer alpha-1 agonist. And again, it's going to hit alpha-2 receptors too, but we mostly care about alpha-1. And with respect to phenylephrine, it really doesn't have any effect on the heart. So if you have a uh, person who's got a really low blood pressure, but maybe their heart rate's high, 
don't necessarily want to do anything with the heart. You just want to increase um, the blood pressure. That's a good drug to try. Um, norepinephrine can be given as a pharmacologic agent, just like it can be released um, endogenously. And norepinephrine is uh, primarily um, alpha and beta activity. It's mostly alpha at lower doses. At higher doses, you get a little bit more beta. Uh, so norepinephrine is another good drug to, to start with. It's kind of probably the most commonly used presser that we will give people who are in shock. Um, epinephrine is not as commonly used. It's more used for very critical cases of um, cardiac arrest or cardiac arrhythmia, and it really stimulates all receptors with equal opportunity. Um, dobutamine is kind of like the, the opposite of phenylephrine. It has very little, if any, alpha activity, but has a lot of beta activity and mostly beta-1 activity. So dobutamine is a pure inotrope, so this could be used in cardiogenic shock, for example, um, when you have, like for example here, you have your systemic vascular resistance up, which means you have an increase in blood pressure. You don't want any more resistance in the systemic um, vascular system. You just want activity within the heart specifically. So dobutamine can just really focus on the heart. Um, albuterol is a drug that is not a presser at all. It's a pulmonary agent, but you can see it has it's similar as far as it's an adrenergic agonist, and you get uh, primarily beta-2 activity, a little bit of beta-1, virtually no alpha. And by giving that as an inhaled agent, you get it right to the lungs onto those beta-2 receptors, relaxing the smooth muscle. Um, if you give enough albuterol, you will see some of these beta-1 effects cross over, and people's heart rates will go up. So that's one problem with albuterol. Um, dopamine um, is also considered a presser too, so you could kind of, again, these first three would be considered pressors and dopamine. Dopamine works on the D1, D2 receptors. It also has some beta activity and some alpha activity, and it really depends on the rate you push it at too. Um, it can vary drastically, but the dopamine activity is going to be there, and depending on how fast or how, uh, how much you're giving, you get beta or alpha activity with it. Phenolbapam. Um, uh, it's not really worth spending much time on it. It's a dopamine agonist that's sort of like dopamine, but doesn't have any real effects on beta or alpha receptors, and it works mostly in the kidneys. Um, it can help get rid of fluid um, for people who, and it can work in, in hypertensive crisis. People have really high blood pressure, so it's kind of the opposite of a presser. It's not going to increase blood pressure or increase inotropic or chronotropic activity, but it is going to increase um, mesenteric blood flow specifically to the kidneys. It's rarely ever used, so again, I don't really want to spend much time on it. Uh, so I just kind of mentioned some pressors and CV emergency. Again, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this during this lecture because we're going to go through this in more detail next summer. Um, but uh, we have different utilities for these drugs, and I kind of walked through them all on the last slide. Here it is in, in a little bit different of a presentation if it helps for you. Um, when it comes to alpha activity, so I talked about alpha-2 being a bit of an odd receptor compared to alpha-1, and there's uh, some different functionality with um, agonizing an alpha-2 receptor within the central nervous system, and it actually works a bit counterintuitive. So with a drug like clonidine or methyl dopa, and we're going to talk about these more when we talk about hypertension, clonidine stimulates alpha-2 in the brainstem, which causes a decrease in sympathetic outflow to the heart, kidneys, and vasculature. Um, which is a bit counterintuitive to what you might think of an alpha agonist doing. You think of an alpha agonist as causing an increase in blood pressure, right, because it's going to be causing vasoconstriction. Well, when you target alpha-2 receptors, specifically in the central nervous system, it causes a downstream effect, which actually works opposite of that, interestingly enough. And um, what it does is it can downregulate um, the release of norepinephrine via a negative feedback loop, too. So it's kind of an interesting mechanism. Again, a bit counterintuitive. Methyl dopa is a drug that's um, well known to be safe in pregnancy and hypertension, and it works the same as clonidine. It's just um, a little bit different. It's a little longer lasting and not quite as potent. Um, and then for sedation, you can give these as well. Um, there's a drug called dexmedetomidine or Presidex that can cause, again, this negative feedback loop of norepinephrine release. It's an interesting sedative that's supposed to be um, low on delirium risk there fix my spelling error there um, so it, it actually does have less delirium so I'll, I'll delete my question mark there and we're going to talk about that more when we talk about sedation and ICU patients next summer respiratory applications I mentioned albuterol already and we're going to go through albuterol in a lot more detail in, in a couple lectures here and 
Um, I talked about how it, it does cross over to the beta-1 receptors. Um, there is a drug called leave albuterol, which is a R isomer of regular albuterol, and it doesn't quite have that um, same affinity for the beta-1 receptor. It mostly sticks to the beta-2. So patients who get really tachycardic on albuterol might use Zopinex. Now, there is a lot of controversy around that. Zopinex is expensive, and most people think that most studies show that it actually doesn't really make a difference whether you use one or the other, but some people believe it does. So you'll see people on it occasionally. Um, we do have long-acting versions of these beta-2 um, agonists, and um, they're useful for um, treating patients with, adver with asthma and COPD, um, and there's a couple of the names there, but we're going to be looking at these in a lot more detail later. Uh, okay, so just to touch on ENT, because this is about all I'll talk about with ENT applications. They don't really have a lot to say as far as drugs go. We're going to talk about steroids. Um, <laughs> excuse me, next time we meet. So we'll get into the immune system and steroids a little bit, which has some ENT applications as well. But really for ENT and sympathetic nervous system, there are some ways we can manipulate it to constrict blood vessels locally. And one of those is with the drug pseudoephedrine or Sudafed, um, notorious for being behind the counter now, and you have to give a driver's license to get some because people make meth out of it. Um, that's my Breaking Bad reference, and I know they didn't use Sudafed to make meth in Breaking Bad, at least not at a lot of that anyway. <laughs> so, but you know, I, I like Breaking Bad a lot, so I have to get it in to the lecture if I can. And um, anyway, Sudafed, what it what it does is it stimulates alpha and beta. It, it does work systemically, however, it tends to have a focus in the respiratory mucosal area, uh, upper lower respiratory tract. For whatever reason, it seems to to have an affinity for that area, so you don't really get too many systemic effects. However, people tend to get a little bit jittery on it. Um, it is a stimulant of sorts, so um, not good to take around bedtime, which is great if you have a stuffy nose and you want to get some sleep. You can't really take Sudafed. Um, some people might not get that effect, but um, most people probably aren't going to be able to sleep if they take a bunch of Sudafed, unfortunately. Um, so otherwise, it, it is fairly effective. I will say that there is... <coughs> um, well, I, I guess I got that in the next bullet point here. So there are some topical agents. Um, phenylephrine nasal spray works pretty well. Uh, that's a topical. Same thing as phenylephrine, the, the presser we just talked about. It's an alpha um, uh, agonist. And then oxymetazoline is afrin. Afrin is a really potent uh, alpha agonist. It's much more potent than phenylephrine. And um, you'll see if you've ever taken afrin and actually read the directions, it says not to use it more than three days because um, the problem is, is it's so potent that um, if you use it continuously, you can end up with rebound um, congestion because you're vasoconstricting to such an extent that you actually cause mucosal damage, which causes inflammation in the area, you actually make the problem worse than it was to start with. So when I... <clears throat> Excuse me. When I tell people to take Afrin, I usually tell them to take, uh, or usually recommend taking it at night um, and not taking it during the day to let your body recover. And um, that way you can, might get a couple more days out of it. So um, I'll take it for four, maybe five days instead of the, the three recommended. If you're using it round the clock, I'd recommend stopping after three. Um, you know, you hear about people who get Afrin addicted, which isn't, it's not an addictive medicine. It's not psychologic by any means. It's purely, a, it's a, it's a physical dependence potentially because you might not be able to breathe very well without it if you use it continuously. And there, there are stories of people who have kind of gone off the deep end with ex excess Afrin use and gotten in trouble that way. Um, it is again, a very, very potent vasoconstrictor. And I think it works like a miracle drug if I have a cold. Um, but yeah, I, I do try and be careful with it. Um, the other nice thing about Afrin is it lasts a long time. It's like a 12 hour duration. So um, you really only have to use it twice a day if you want full continuous coverage. So it can be a really nice um, drug to, to try that way. It is over the counter. So a lot of people probably don't realize that they shouldn't be taking it a lot. So when people do get these tolerances, not necessarily tolerance, that's the wrong word, dependence to, um, to Afrin, uh, that can be... Uh, because probably they just weren't educated well on it, or they bought it over the counter and it worked and they kept using it. Uh, under phenylephrine, I put what about oral PE, Sudafed PE? So oral phenylephrine doesn't work. It actually has been clinically proven that it really has no effect on um, nasal decongestion, but it is the one you can get without having to go to the pharmacy counter. Um, and Sudafed rebranded themselves as Sudafed PE to keep their product over the counter. Um, it doesn't contain actual pseudoephed pseudoephedrine. It's phenylephrine, which um, orally does not really work and clinically has been proven to not really work all that well. So if you take it and it doesn't do anything, don't be surprised. All right. 
Um, some other applications to uh, for sympathetic agonists you have um, or sympathetic uh, yeah agonists you have um, uterine applications. So there's a drug called terbutaline, which is a beta two agonist that works um, specifically um, in the what well, is designed to work specifically on the beta two receptors found on the smooth mus muscle of the uterus. It also has some pulmonary effects too, so um, it may have some applications for respiratory distress. However, I don't see it used a lot in that situation. It is used to slow down labor, though. We're going to talk about it a little bit more when we talk about OB stuff next summer. Um, Midodrine is a alpha one agonist, and um, by giving somebody an it's an oral alpha one agonist. So we have obviously drugs we talked about that are alpha one agonists that work in emergencies and are IV, um, and we give for people who have critically low bl blood pressure. This is um, a drug that we can give to people who are chronically having orthostatic hypotension. So they get really bad dizzy spells when they stand up a lot. Some drugs cause this. Sometimes people just have it. Uh, and midodrine can be is a general alpha agonist that can prevent that from happening. Um, pri oh, that's another misspelling here. Priapism is a, if you've never heard the term, it's a sustained erection, on a sta sustained unwanted erection. Uh, and it can happen for a number of reasons. You can, it can be medication induced. Um, that's probably the most common one. Um, there's sickle cell, which can cause a priapism, but that's a bit different of a mechanism. Um, and then there's other things that can cause it too. But priapism, um, we can treat it by giving people um, intracavernosal, injected directly into the penis. And we can inject them with phenylephrine, which is, uh, again, an alpha-1 agonist, and that can be useful. And I've actually had to prepare that for uh, physicians a number of times, so it, it is something that's used occasionally in practice. So if you work ER, oops, sorry, if you work ER or urgent care, you may or may not see this occasionally, as unfortunate as it sounds. All right. Okay, so let's switch gears so that we're talking about agonists and adrenergic agonists. Now let's switch gears to antagonists. So these are going to be blockers, and basically you have alpha or beta blockers. Um, alpha blockers uh, end in osin, and uh, prosocin is the drug uh, that's the kind of the archetypical alpha blocker. Beta blockers end in OLOL, or at least LOL, um, like propranolol is the archetypical beta blocker here that we're going to use as our example. Um, we're going to talk about these in a lot of detail during blood pressure, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them right now. Uh, so we'll get to them in a couple of weeks here. Um, basically, what, what the deal is is that they... They block either alpha or beta receptors. In doing so, they work to um, help with blood pressure or um, uh, alpha blockers specifically have been shown to be helpful for benign prostatic hyperplasia. We'll, we'll get to that as well. Um, here's an example of beta blockers. There's a bunch of them. And again, we're going to go through these in more detail. And I'm going to, I won't ask you about specifics of beta blockers on this exam. Um, when we go to cardiology, we'll, we'll talk about what I want you to know as far as these go. But the point is that there's a lot of different beta blockers out there that are all, some are oral, some are IV, most are oral. And you have some are more selective than others. You can see some are beta 1 selective, others have 1 and 2 activity. Um, some drugs like Carvedilol, whoops, excuse me, sorry, wrong slide. Some drugs like Carvedilol also have alpha blocking activity, and so there's differences with how we use them. Some like Timolol, it's an ophthalmic agent only used for glaucoma, so these beta blockers have a lot of different utility. Um, alpha blockers, uh, again, we're looking at prosocin. There's other drugs called doxazosin and terazosin, um, and there's some newer ones that are much more selective. So there's this alpha 1A subtype. Wow, I really didn't spell very well during this lecture. Switch that there. Um, you have this alpha 1A subtype, which is prostate selective. And um, it's these are the newer drugs focusing on specific prostate um, receptors to relax a smooth muscle in the bladder neck and um, smooth muscle in the prostate gland to help urine flow um, more easily for men who have BPH. Um, the older drugs are much less selective, and they cause a lot of um, peripheral uh, alpha blockade as well, which can cause orthostatic hypotension because your peripheral vasculature can't contract and, and change blood pressure like it normally would when you need to stand up and maybe need to get some blood pressure going. So you have end up with an orthostatic response. So newer drugs, more selective. And we're going to go through this a little bit more when we talk about men's health next uh, spring sometime. All right, so some other drugs just to mention quickly, and these aren't really 
all that important. Um, but psych drugs, there are some antipsychotics, some antidepressants that have a lot of alpha blocking activity. So what you'll hear me say is, that, oh, this drug has orthostatic hypotension as a side effect. When I say that, I'm usually referring to that it blocks alpha receptors. And that's usually not an intended effect of it, but it's something that just happens because the, the molecule is close enough to um, a sympathomimetic that it actually hits a uh, receptor and blocks that. Um, and that's just a, a side effect and consequence of using the drug. Um, there is a drug out there called reserpine, which is a really old medication. It's kind of like a last line for really resistant hypertension. And it's kind of interesting because it depletes norepinephrine, norepinephrine supply, and then it also blocks norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake. What that does in the central nervous system is it increases um, vagal response, which causes bradycardia and therefore decreases blood pressure. It's a really bad drug. It has a lot of side effects, including causing a fair amount of depression. These neurotransmitters uh, are essential for mood and um, yeah, that's it's just not a, a drug we like to use. So if you see somebody on it, it's likely because they've been on it for a while or because they have really resistant uh, hypertension. I don't think I've actually ever seen anyone take the drug, but I've heard about it. It's kind of a, a myth among the pharmacy world. And we had, a, we had a pharmacy professor in school who always talked about reserpine, so it's kind of a joke among us, but I figured I, I had to mention it. I won't, I won't test you on reserpine, so don't worry about it. Um, guanfacine is an alpha-2A selective um, uh, central nervous system acting drug that's actually useful for ADHD and it's useful in kids a lot. So we use guanfacine as a non-stimulant. So like it's not like Adderall or Ritalin where they're basically stimulants that work directly on um, increasing norepinephrine levels within the central nervous system. But uh, this works a little bit differently. And we're going to talk about that when I talk about uh, psych meds. So we'll get to that uh, at some point here next spring. All right, so here's my joke. You've got uh, um, the different beta blockers here, which will make more sense when we talk more about beta blockers. But you've got, um, here's propranolol. You can see propranolol on this old man's cane. He's the original. Uh, and then you've got, uh, he's pretty non-selective. He doesn't work on any specific beta receptors. And you've got atenolol. He's like kind of the newer guy, um, middle, not quite middle-aged, still young. Uh, but um, he's a bit shiny. He's got the beta-1 selective for the most part, but also has some other activity. Then you have the young guy who is carvedilol, and he's got, he's actually non-selective, but he actually added on alpha activity, so there's some maybe added utility of having alpha activity by giving carvedilol, so it's kind of a funny drawing. Um, all right, so with that in mind, um, this is, again, the focus of this lecture is to get you exposed to some receptor pharmacology. We're going to go through the therapeutics of this stuff in a lot more detail as we hit each individual topic, but I think it's helpful to, to go through some of this right now before we get into more of the, um, the guidelines and, and uh, the therapeutic discussions. Okay, so I'm going to start into the next group of slides here. We're just going to go through about the first 20 slides or so. And then um, we'll, we'll get into um, the remainder of it the next week. So I figured we've got some extra time. Only was about an hour for that first lecture. And um, the respiratory stuff, I want to have enough time to go through it in detail because it's important. I think it's common diseases we should spend a decent amount of time talking about. So anyway, um, getting into this anti-allergic, anti-inflammatory immune system group, which is sort of a nebulous group of stuff. And again, it's a lot of intro stuff that we're going to come back to and touch on at different points, but some of it we're really only going to talk about today. So I'm going to go through the um, antihistamine portion and leave sort of the immune system. Uh, we'll go through the antihistamine, maybe into some of the anti-inflammatory stuff, and then we'll come back to the immune system um, uh, next week. So what are we going to be covering? Um, this is going to be smooth muscle drugs, mostly that have effects on a variety of systems. So antihistamines is probably going to be the biggest class we're going to talk about. Not really going to talk about serotonin very much. Um, we'll, get, we'll get to that all later. I'll touch on it very br briefly, and then we'll talk about some prostaglandin leukotriene effects. So there's a wide variety of applications here from allergies to pain management to depression to nausea, etc. So there's a uh, there's tons we can talk about here, and again, it's just an intro group of slides that we're going to flesh out each of these topics much at later dates. Um, my joke here is, what if I'm allergic to antihistamine? It's always great when you see somebody whose allergy is to an antihistamine like Benadryl or um, or other ones, and you're like, how could you possibly be allergic to that? That's what we use to treat allergies, so it's kind of funny. 
Um, histamine is the essential mediator in the body for an allergic reaction. It's an inflammatory mediator. Uh, interestingly enough, though, it's kind of got a modest role in anaphylaxis. When you have an anaphylactic response, when your you know, throat's swelling, can't breathe, whatnot, um, a lot of that has to do with um, uh, different mediators. But histamine is definitely a component of that. It's just not the only component. Um, gastric acid secretion is also something that histamine is responsible for. Um, and then there's uh, neurotransmitter involvement too within the central nervous system, which is a bit more undetermined as far as using it as a pharmacologic agent. As far as histamine itself goes, histamine is not a pharmacologically useful thing. We don't want to cause a histaminic response in people. There's really no reason to ever do that. So when it comes to drugs, we're always talking about blocking different types of histamine. Okay, so uh, immunolog immunologic release. When you're talking about um, immediate allergic reactions and type 1 hy hypersensitivity, histamine is going to be something that, that is present. So um, there is various cells that, have, that contain histamine, and when they come in contact with an allergen, you can see the B cell here um, interacting with the allergen uh, in this diagram. And then um, what's released are these um, IgE antibodies. These IgE antibodies then will interact with a mast cell. Mast cells have these granules that contain histamine and among other chemicals. When the IgE antibody interacts with that, um, it kind of activates the mast cell and then the allergen will also be floating around there. It will finally interact with that and that's going to cause a release of histamine and other chemicals. So you get kind of a, a two-phase there with the beta cell needing to be activated by the allergy needing to activate the mast cell, and then finally the allergen needs to activate again those IgE molecules on that, um, on that mast cell to release histamine. So histamine receptors and mechanism of action, uh, again, they're widely present throughout the body. Um, the primary ones we're going to be looking at are um, within... Uh, well, I guess we can look at a couple. Let's just go down the list. So central nervous system, um, not really anything we're going to be useful here. Uh, as far as um, anything that's going to be antihistaminic in the central nervous system can actually have a decent effect on appetite. We see that sometimes with our antipsychotic drugs, and uh, we'll get to that more during um, the psychiatric lecture, so don't worry about that right now. Um, histamine and cardi cardiac effects, not a ton we want to talk about here. Um, bronchoconstriction is something that histamine can cause. You know, and, and if you think about the way that uh, allergic response goes and getting more to anaphylaxis uh, type response, you have bronchoconstriction, you have uh, blood pressure changes, heart rate changes. Those things can all be problematic in a um, in a situation when you have an increase in histamine. And while these things are important in anaphylaxis, you also have a lot of other mediators that are getting triggered. And usually what causes anaphylaxis to be so severe is more along the lines of um, different types of inflammatory mediators, which are actually causing the inflammation. Histamine itself doesn't necessarily cause a lot of inflammation. Um, so you have a number of other things, gastric acid secretion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, nothing I really want to point out here specifically. Um, so when we're blocking histamine, uh, the idea is to oppose whatever effect histamine is causing. Um, we have physiologic things that can oppose histamine activity. So like epinephrine, uh, we talked about as a sympath, the mimetic agent can work to oppose the effects of histamine. But mostly what epinephrine is going to do if you give it in like an acute allergic situation is going to oppose the effects of those inflammatory mediators that are also getting released. So it's not really a physiologic um, antagonist of histamine, but you could kind of consider it to be a little bit, um, although histamine is not going to cause a ton of inflammation on, in of itself. Um, releasing inhibition, uh, so you can um, reduce mast cell degranulation. There are some drugs that can help stabilize mast cells and prevent them from releasing histamine altogether. And then, of course, receptor antagonists directly, so targeting specifically H1 or H2 receptors, and there's a lot of pharmacologic agents that work in this category. So our release state inhibitors, um, there's a drug called chromalin, which is a mast cell stabilizer. It's used for allergic rhinitis. Uh, it's a nasal spray that comes as three to four times a day. Um, it is pretty safe in pregnancy, and it is over the counter, so it's one that could be used. It's not the best drug in the world, but it, it might work for some people, specifically for allergies. Probably not going to help for like a um, sinus congestion or a rhinovirus, but um, for um, seasonal allergies, it could be a good option. 
You can also get it as or eye drops. I think it did come or still does come as an oral inhaler. Um, but again, we don't really use it for anything other than just allergic rhinitis for mostly for pregnant women. <laughs> um, first generation antihistamines are still heavily used today. Diphenhydramine or Benadryl is our most common one that everyone's probably heard of. It's available, um, not OTX, to be OTC. Uh, available OTC over the counter and a prescription. There's a lot of different combination products available. It's used as needed um, for most people. So most people aren't taking Benadryl chronically. There's not a whole lot of reason to do that. You'd probably be heavily sedated and get anticholinergic if you tried to do that. But you could potentially try that. Um, if you're really having sustained like itching and response, I just wouldn't anticipate you being all that functional. Um, available uh, IV or IM, so we can give this in acute situations as an antihistamine of choice for people undergoing like in a severe anaphylactic type reaction. Um, there's other indications. Again, people take this mostly for allergies. You can use it as a topical product uh, for um, local um, irritation. And it also works as a sleep aid. It's highly sedating due to its anticholinergic properties. So I don't recommend Benadryl as a sleep aid because I think that most people probably get unpleasant side effects because of that anticholinergic um, property to it. But, um, you know, it's over the counter. It's easy to get. So a lot of people will do that anyway. And it also we talked about its use as an anti-emetic in the last lecture, in the last set of slides. So um, that's definitely a possibility too. Hydroxazine is another first generation antihistamine. It's very similar to diphenhydramine. How it doesn't have it doesn't have uh, anticholinergic effects to an appreciable level. It has some, um, but it's much less sedating. It's still a little bit sedating, uh, but people can maybe get by with taking it during the day a little bit easier. Um, we use this drug a lot to reduce narcotic induced pruritus. So a lot of our opioid drugs like um, I don't know, oxycodone and morphine cause itching. That's a pretty common response because they have an indirect mechanism that causes the release of histamine. So we give them antihistamines to give patients antihistamines to help them with that side effect while they're maybe taking them in the acute phase after surgery, or for example. Um, hydroxazine comes IV, IM. Uh, it comes orally, doses as needed. And it has a ton of psychiatric applications. We use it a lot as an anxiolytic medication for some reason. So again, the, the histamine receptor is all over the place, and specifically it does exist in the central nervous system. So there is some thought that hydroxazine is working on some unusual mechanism there that doesn't really have to do with its necessarily antihistaminic property like we would think of in the traditional sense, but more of an antihistaminic property uh, in within the central nervous system that we don't quite understand. But it's a non... Uh, we're going to talk about this more when we talk about anxiety, but it's a non-habit-forming um, anxiolytic medication, so it could be uh, a good alternative. But you'll see, if you work mental health, you'll see this used all the time. Um, what else about first-generation antihistamines? A couple other drugs not really commonly used. Brofeniramine is um, present in a lot of cough and cold combination products you'll see over-the-counter. Um, so it's like it's like I think Dimatap is the the standard like brand name of it, but I can't remember. There's a lot of different brands of it, um, but it is a antihistamine, not necessarily a cough suppressant per se. It's probably most useful for just making people sleepy, um, so it doesn't really have any role in treating any actual type of cough and cold symptoms. But that's the general rule when it comes to cough and cold products anyway. You, you aren't really doing anything when you take them. hate to break it to you if you if you rely on something. It's probably not doing a whole lot. Um, promethazine is a antihistamine similar to diphenhydramine. However, this also has a, some structural activity similar to antipsychotic medications. So people tend to get a little bit in, uh, I don't know if they get like um, uh, some sort of a buzz off of it or what, but it is a, a somewhat of a drug of abuse. People like to um, consume large amounts of promethazine with codeine cough syrup, and they call it, <laughs> I'll say this here, syrup, <laughs> and it's the uh, the typical, um, you, you, you hear about this in the news every once in a while. It probably hasn't come up in a while. Lil Wayne was in the hospital um, due to uh, consuming too much promethazine with cough, codeine cough syrup and ended up having seizures due to the promethazine component. I think people generally abuse it because of the codeine component. It, it, obviously, codeine is a narcotic and it's an opioid. Um, it's a weak opioid, but if you drink enough of it, it probably gives you a decent effect. Um, and then the promethazine probably causes some sedation and also some um, central nervous system effects as well, which uh, obviously if you take too much, tends to have nasty side effects. So uh, just 
forewarned. Um, this product isn't really available much anymore. I don't think, I think promethazine in general with codeine was uh, pulled by a lot of manufacturers because of the abuse was just rampant. So people were like, well, this is not really a good clinical use for this drug anyway. Let's get rid of it altogether. So some people may be making it now, but I know that a couple of the major manufacturers at least stopped making it altogether. Uh, second generation antihistamines are long acting, non drowsy versions of their first generation cousins. Uh, they're usually once day, daily dose. They're all over the counter now. They started as prescription a while ago, but now they're all OTC and they're generic. Um, these are well tolerated drugs. Um, and sometimes you'll see them combined with pseudoephedrine. The idea is that if somebody has a cold, you help with the histaminic response and you also can give that uh, vasoconstriction uh, in the nasal mucosa to help with the congestion. Um, loratadine or Claritin, Fexofenadine or Allegra, and Cetirizine or Zyrtec are the most common ones. Levocetirizine is Zizol, and Desloratadine is Clarinex. I believe those two might still be prescription only, but they're basically just different versions of the same thing. There's no reason to buy them or pay for them or ever prescribe them. Um, if a patient tells you they get a better response from that, it's probably just in their head. And I'm not joking because it's really the same thing. I don't understand why. I ever once in a while I see somebody on that and I, I really don't get it. Um, I suppose it's, it's, I'll never say never. It's always possible somebody could try everything and really truthfully not get an effect from anything other than one of the newer ones. But I would find that very hard to believe that that's actually possible because they're, they're very effective drugs and they're essentially the same thing. So I, I, I don't get it. Um, combining them or um, comparing them head to head, there isn't really any data to say one's better than the other. They all work fine. They all work the same way. Um, the reason why they are um, non-drowsy is because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier very well, whereas Benadryl diphenhydramine does. That's why it's pretty drowsy and also because it's heavily anticholinergic. Um, some people say that they do get drowsy still off Claritin um, at higher doses. So if somebody's getting drowsy on Claritin, maybe they could try Allegra or Zyrtec. Um, Allegra has some um, interactions with fruit juice. It can interfere with metabolism of the drug. Um, Cetirizine doesn't really have anything specific about it. It's kind of a nice middle of the road one that um, isn't too sedating compared to Claritin potentially, but theoretically none of them should be sedating. Um, histamine 2 blockers, we'll talk about more when we talk about GI stuff, but um, there's three of them on the market. They're all pretty well, two of them are pretty commonly used, famotidine and ranitidine, or pepsid and Zantac. Cimetidine is Tagamet, which um, is an older drug. It's kind of the exception to the other two. The other two are well tolerated. They're twice daily dosed. Um, they're over the counter. They're cheap. Um, Cimetidine is all of those things generally too, but it's more frequently dosed. It's also... Uh, causes a lot of drug interactions. It inhibits a lot of different types of CYP enzymes, so that's not something we like. And um, people tend to get a little bit confused on it, specifically elderly patients. We aren't sure why. It might be a little bit anticholinergic, but it tends to have some unusual side effects with it. So cimetidine generally is avoided. Um, serotonin is something I'm not going to talk about a lot today, other than that it is a really important neurotransmitter. Um, there's uh, locations of serotonin receptor subtypes in the GI tract um, on platelets. It's got a role in migraine headaches. It has some vasoconstrictive properties when um, manipulated within the central nervous system. And there's a ton of psychiatric uh, components to serotonin use. So um, there's a lot of drugs that target different receptor subtypes. And we really aren't going to be talking about it a lot in detail right now. All right, so I think that's probably enough for now. Actually, just kidding. Let me get through these next five slides, and then we'll be at a really good stopping point where we can go right into the immune system. So these next five slides are quite quite straightforward, I think. Um, this, this is just really an intro to the body's inflammatory system, and I think it goes hand-in-hand hand with immune, immunology. So we have arachidonic acid, uh, which is a molecule that's a precursor to a group of um, transmitters and inflammatory messengers called eicosanoids. Um, so why this is important is arachidonic acid gets released by an, uh, various stimuli, so like tissue injury, um, local whatever damage to, to blood vessels or whatnot. And then arachidonic acid convert, gets converted by cyclooxygenases or COX enzymes um, further into prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxanes, and leukotrienes. And these are all body's really primary inflammatory mediators. So when we're talking about anaphylaxis, 
these are the things that are really causing a substantial inflammatory response that we're trying to worry about. And also these are things that are responsible for pain. Leukotrienes is a fairly large component in um, asthma inflammation. Thromboxane works on platelets. So um, when you have tissue injury, one of arachidonic's acid role is to activate thromboxane, which can then uh, in turn activate platelets, which can cause clots. So there's a lot of things going on with arachidonic acid and icosanoids. Um, this diagram shows it a little bit easier. So we have arachidonic acid here in the center. Um, so we have LOX, which is lipoxygenase, which will convert it into leukotrienes, and then cyclooxygenase, which converts it into all three other ones. So if you block different enzymes, if you block lipoxygenase, you can decrease the production of leukotrienes. And if you block cyclooxygenases, one or two, um, or different subtypes, you can decrease these inflammatory mediators. So like our drugs, NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are our primary medications that we use for pain, like ibuprofen, naproxen. Not, they're really popular non-opioid pain meds. They work in this area to decrease inflammation. All right, so um, just to talk about the different types of cyclooxygenases, and this will be reviewed during the pain lecture as well. But COX-1 is a constantly active enzyme. It's generally responsible for housekeeping prostaglandins. So prostaglandins are good for us. They aren't always just responsible for problematic inflammation. And we have a lot of them that help our body out, specifically in the GI tract. And um, can, uh, prostaglandins can cause gastric epithelial cytoprotection. COX-2 is an inducible enzyme, and it may be upregulated depending on a stimuli. So if you get some sort of tissue damage, it may upregulate COX-2. And this is a major source of inflammatory and also some cancer-related prostaglandins that are preferred. But this is a very simplified way to describe COX-1 versus 2. But um, the point of this is that with um, when we're treating for pain management, so for like treating with an NSAID, um, NSAIDs need to cover COX-2. We don't have any drugs that are just COX-1 selective. We have NSAIDs that are non-selective, meaning they cover both COX-1 and COX-2. We have NSAIDs that are COX-2 selective, but you have to cover COX-2 if you're going to target pain source uh, via these inflammatory mediators. Um, the problem is, is that you, COX-1 is sort of collateral damage and you end up decreasing the production of these housekeeping prostaglandins, which can cause um, uh, problems within the GI tract. And if you take NSAIDs chronically, you are at, at higher risk of a GI bleed because of that. Um, lipooxygenase forms um, leukotrienes, and leukotrienes are potent bronchoconstrictors. They're a component of asthma and anaphylaxis, so they're another um, mediator that's going to be very <clears throat> problematic in anaphylaxis because it's causing bronchoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature. And so we have some drugs here that target either leukotriene receptors or um, block the enzyme activity itself. And we'll talk about these a little bit more with asthma. Um, prostaglandins and prostacyclins, uh, by themselves, they can be kind of useful as drugs. We're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension a little bit more during CARDS, but um, we do have prostacyclins that can be given locally um, within the pulmonary artery. So there's a, a port that gets installed in the patient directly to the pulmonary artery, which can cause direct uh, vasodilation there to decrease the pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then as far as OBGYN goes, um, we use prostaglandins like misoprostol and dinoprostone in, in that setting as well to help with um, cervical ripening and some other things. Uh, glaucoma, there's a lot of different prostacyclin agents too, which we'll talk about during that lecture coming up here shortly. So again, just wanted to give you a quick intro here uh, to these topics and we'll get into all these in more depth. Um, we're going to go into the immune system in a fair amount of detail. Next lecture, we're going to talk about the immune system, talk specifically about how we suppress it and how we get pharmacologic response from that. So that'll be coming up shortly. Um, if you Again, if you have any questions about those first slide sets, let me know. Uh, but just remember, it's very broad information for a reason, and it's just a, an intro until we get into more of the, the therapeutic benefit of using some of these agents.